same. So this is um, 13.5. Thirteen point five um, lines and planes. So uh, we're actually going to start describing geometric um, objects uh, using um, what we've learned, vectors, uh, namely. Okay, so uh, the deal is that uh, all of this is happening in space. So maybe I should write in space, right? Because we all know about lines in the plane. Right, um, y equals mx plus b, or the uh, point-slope uh, form. Uh, the problem is that in space, how do we describe a line? Okay. All right. So uh, let's just start with uh, regular lines um, in R two in the plane. Right. So what is it that characterizes a line? Well, uh, we all know that a line is determined by a point, right, um, and a direction. Okay, um, if you have those two bits of information, uh, then you know what line you're talking about, right? Like if I tell you I'm working with the line through this point that has that direction, then everybody knows that I'm talking about this particular line right there. All right. Okay, now, um, how do we express this uh, point and direction in um, uh, high school math or whatever? Uh, if the point were x0, y0, x0, y0, um, then we would write something like y minus y0 equals m x minus x0, right? This is the point slope form um, of the equation of the line. Um, and you can see in this formula, right? There's the point, x0, comma, y0, and the slope is what gives me the direction. Right? For example, the slope, uh, if the slope is... Uh, three halves, then that's telling me the direction is the one where uh, every time I go two steps to the right, then I have to move three steps up, okay? So even in regular uh, kind of the simplistic lines in R2, um, we've, we've always been describing lines as a point and a direction. Okay, R3 in space. Um, what are lines? Same thing. Right. If I even in space, if I tell you a point, um, and I tell you a direction, right? I tell you this point. I tell you this direction. Then everybody knows I'm talking about this particular line there, and no other line. Okay. All right. Now the great thing is, um, we know we we now have the technology to talk about directions, right? In terms of uh, vectors. So let's um, let's try to write down the, the or try to express. Uh, a line that passes through, let's say, the, a point um, x naught, y naught, z naught, and that has direction described by the vector abc. Okay. All right. Um, so the the point of view we're going to take is um, is like this. So let me draw the uh, space again, or R three again. Okay, let's say uh, my point is here, x naught, y naught, z naught. Okay, what I'm gonna do, or at least the, the way I'm gonna introduce this, is I'm gonna think about uh, the vector that goes from the origin to my point of interest, all right? So this vector is sharp brackets, x naught, y naught, z naught. Again, in contrast to the parentheses, which just describes a point. Okay. All right. Um, let's say my uh, direction ABC is sorry is kind of like um, let me do it in a different color is like uh, like this. All right. So this is the vector ABC, and I've put it um, so that its tail is at x x naught y naught z naught. All right. Okay. Now think about this. Um, if I uh, add x0, y0, uh, z0 to abc, I'm going to get a vector that looks like that looks like that. All right, so that's the sum of the two. And what's important is that the sum of these two actually lives on the line that we're interested in, right? The line that we're interested in looks perhaps something like 
If I extend it this way, it looks like that. If I extend it that way, it looks like that. Okay, so this isn't a coincidence. Um, in fact, if I add um, this uh, x0, y0, z0 vector with anything times ABC, it's going to live on my line, right? For example, if I add um, x0, y0, z0 plus 2 times ABC, that's going to represent the point uh, where, let's see, I start from the origin, I go to x, so uh, x0, y0, z0, right? So I start from the, I should have a comma there. Okay, so I start from the origin. Uh, in order to do this addition, um, I go to the, head, to, to the head of x0, y0, z0, and then I go two, um, two steps of the vector ABC. So the first step of the vector ABC uh, leads me to this point, and then another step of the vector ABC leads me to that point. And of course, I'm on the line, right? Because I'm still moving in the direction ABC, all right? So the important thing is that any number I put here will keep me on the line, all right? Whether it be one, whether it be two, whether it be zero, which would be um, my kind of uh, base point right here, or negative five, right? Which would represent a point perhaps down here on the line, okay? So um, all these, all these, um, points are on the line, uh, no matter what number I put here. And in fact, of course, um, every point that is on the line is going to correspond to some number in that slot. Okay, so this point, uh, let's say this point right there on the line is probably it looks like it's going to correspond to um, x0, y0, z0 plus v, uh, plus my vector abc, and then plus another half of abc. So this entry right there would be 3 over 2. Okay, so in short, um, I can describe every point on my line as x0, y0, z0, plus some number t times abc. All right. Okay, and, um, you know, given different t's, I get different points on my line. All right. Um, our notation for this is r like that. That describes my line. So this r describes, this vector r describes um, a point on the line, all right? Or it's, let me say it more accurately, its head, when you put its tail at the origin, describes a point on the line, okay? And often we put r of t because, um, you know, we'll, we'll want to uh, put in variable different t's depending on where, which location we're interested in on this line, all right? Okay, oftentimes, um, we'll call this guy right there, this kind of the point that we've, uh, that we uh, base everything on. We call it perhaps something like R0, all right? And if we call this guy V, our vector V, then we have a shorthand. This is R0 plus T times V, okay? All right, so this describes for me um, lines in, uh, in space, okay? Um, very useful uh, because um, the idea of uh, point slope or y equals mx plus b is just not going to work. One equation um, cannot describe a line in space. All right. Okay. Um, let me talk about a another um, point of view, uh, one that I actually like uh, better. Um, and that's going to be, so this is like the, this, um, this is a vector description of the equation of a line. Uh, we're, we are going to use it quite a bit, but there's another point of view, which I like better, which is the parametric, um, equations for a line or of a line. doesn't really matter. Okay. So, um, how do we, what is this all about? Uh, so in a way, uh, the reason I actually don't really like, um, kind of in, in a way philosophically, um, I don't like this uh, previous description is that um, it's not, it's in a way not natural. Um, why are we describing points on a line using a vector, right? 
A point on a line is just a point on a line, right? This point right there is just a point on a line. That point right there is a point on a line. Why are we kind of um, using the, the necess why do we have to use the tools of a vector, right, to describe these points on a line, okay? Um, for example, uh, this point right there, right, we're describing uh, right there, this would be R of one, right? It would be this blue arrow right there, right? This blue arrow is R of one, okay? So it's not, it feels um, slightly unnatural. Unnatural, especially considering the way we, um, we usually think of lines, right? As just a collection of points in um, R2 or a collection of points in R3. So the second description is, um, doesn't have to go through vectors. Uh, but, it, but we can use what we just discussed to describe, um, to, to, uh, to describe lines in this second way. So let me look at um, our equation again. So r of t equals x0, x0, y0, z0, plus t, a, b, c. So same line, let's, let's talk about the same line. Okay, let me add all the components together into, the, into kind of one sharp bracket vector. So this is x0 plus t times a, comma, y0 plus t times b, comma, z0 plus t times c. All right. Okay, uh, what is this? Well, um, like I said, this R of T uh, is a vector that whose head, the position of its head describes a point on a line, All right? So um, these three coordinates are coordinates, um, the X, Y, and Z coordinates of a point on a line. So instead of having to kind of write it in terms of vectors, I can just write this. My line is described as X, the X coordinate, if I uh, look at the uh, teeth entry, this is gonna be x0 plus ta. Uh, the y coordinate is y0 plus tb. And then the um, third coordinate, the z coordinate is z0 plus tc. All right. Actually, why I've been writing these, uh, let me write it. It looks a little weird to have the t in front. So let me write it. It doesn't matter, of course, uh, at. B, T, C, T, all right? Because just because we usually like to write variables um, after the constants. Okay, um, yeah, that is making me a little uncomfortable. Let me, uh, let me change all of these. Okay, A, T, B, T, C, T. All right, um, so this describes my line. Right? It's actually literally the same thing, right? The, the amount of information um, these two methods uh, of describing a line, the amount of information they give is literally the same. But it's just that the first one, you're thinking through the, uh, the tools of, of vectors, but the second one, you don't really need the tool of vectors, right? I'm just saying, well, when t is equal to 17, I get a point on the line. That point is x, uh, x of 17, comma, y of 17, comma, z of 17, whatever that happens to be, all right? So again, this is called um, the parametric equations for a line. Um, whenever you hear the word parametric, it's great because um, it allows us to work on things that are very complicated by porting them to situations which are much easier, okay? All right, um, what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean is, you can even see it here, right? So uh, what we're describing, what these three uh, equations describe is a line in, the pl in, in space, right, in R3. So something fairly complicated, right, a line in space. Um, it could be through any point, right? It could be in any direction. Uh, very complicated. But now I've boiled it down uh, with these three equations to basically just something about T, right? There's only one variable here going on now instead of potentially, right, uh, three, three variables or whatever, x, y, z, and stuff like that. So um, we'll see this very soon, actually. We'll, we'll be able to port many problems, for example, a problem on this line in space. If I have a, a problem that involves this line in space, I'll be able to convert it to a problem, just uh, one variable um, using the variable t. Right, so problems here will become problems here through this uh, set of equations and using the variable t.
Okay, and that's great because uh, multivariable or, or you know calculus, let's say, on this line is complicated because it's a line in space. But calculus over here on this left side is just one variable calculus, which we all know, right? So we're reducing a problem that might be very complicated to one just from just in uh, one variable calculus. Okay, super powerful uh, idea, and um, we're going to be using it a lot in our class. This idea of uh, uh, parameterization. Okay, um, another point of view uh, you can take, or uh, yeah, another point of view you can take here when you think about these equations is uh, motion. So the equations that we just described, let me actually write it again, x of t equals um, x naught plus uh, at, y of t equals y naught plus bt, and z of t is equal to z naught plus ct. Um, you can think of this as describing motion along a line in space. So kind of real life uh, 3D motion, right? So maybe um, the motion of an airplane, right? So an airplane is here and it's flying in that direction uh, towards here, okay? Um, that's why we use the variable t to describe these because frequently we do want to think about things in terms of motion. And when we do think about things in terms of motion, we think about uh, where we are at time t, right? So that's exactly what this guy is, is in a way describing, right? At time zero, uh, kind of at our starting time, we are um, at the position x0, y0, z0, right? So maybe if that was here, x0, y0, z0, we're right there, right? And as time passes, t equals a half, t equals one, t equals two, um, when we plug in those t's, we get different locations on the line, right? As if we were traveling in time, okay? Traveling as time passes, let me say, not traveling in time, all right? And negative t would correspond to where we were in the past, right? So t equals minus one would be where we were, let's say one second ago, as we were traveling um, along this line, okay? Um, so, this guy right here, x0, y0, z0, describes my initial position. And this ABC here describes my velocity. Or uh, I, maybe I should call it, um, yeah, uh, describes my velocity. Right? This is my velocity vector. Okay? So if ABC is a very long vector, then I'm going to be traveling very fast. And if ABC is a very short vector, I'm going to be traveling very slow. And that makes perfect sense because... Um, again, if I'm starting out here and ABC is a short vector like this, right? Then when I when I get when I have t equals one, I've traveled only from my initial point to here, right? So a short distance. Whereas if ABC were very long, were a very long vector, then I would be you know when t equals one, I would be traveling from here all the way to there. All right. So this it makes perfect sense that this is uh, my velocity. Okay. Okay, um, this brings me to another point, and that's that um, there's many ways to describe a line, right? So I can describe the same line, the exact same line, using a different starting point. Maybe um, uh, maybe I start there instead, right? Maybe I should use a different color. Okay, so maybe I start, no, sorry. Maybe I start there, what is going on? There we go. Maybe I start there instead, and then um, I describe using the velocity like that, right? That's perfectly legit. I'm going to get a description of the same exact line, um, but it'll be a different description, right? In terms of motion, both of these would describe um, traveling along this line, except... Um, uh, except one is traveling starting from here and then moving uh, kind of upper right, and the other is starting here, traveling lower down. Okay, so it makes sense that there are multiple description of a line, descriptions of a line if you use this kind of um, uh, technique, because there's multiple ways of moving along a line. All right. Okay, um, this is a very important um, point of view to take, uh, this motion point of view, because. Um, we're going to be doing, uh, very soon, we're going to be doing calculus on curves in space. And uh, we're going to have lots of quantities that we're going to be uh, 
having to look at and interpreting the whole subject in a way um, of curves in space in terms of motion is going to make a lot of those quantities make perfect sense to us uh, because we're all used to talking about motion and uh, position and speed and velocity and stuff like that. So um, this right here, this discussion of, uh, of a line in terms of motion is a baby version of what we'll be doing um, actually next week. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, of course, uh, because A, B, and C is just, it's always, it's, it's uh, um, uh, let me say it like this. Uh, this. This guy here describes motion with constant velocity, right? We're moving at a constant speed um, over time, right? Um, next week, we'll be talking, we'll be able to describe motion um, in space uh, with varying velocities. And so we'll be able to actually model real life motion. Okay. Um, I guess this has all been abstract. Let me just write down a quick example. So let's say uh, describe the line oops, through the points. That looks weird. Uh, one comma three comma minus one, and four comma two comma seven. All right. Okay. So, in other words, write down the vector uh, equation and maybe also write down the param uh, parametric equation. Okay. So again, um, whenever you need to describe a line, you just need a point and a direction. So you'll see prob problems on the homework where um, you have to describe a certain line. And they might give you information which is um, not exactly a point and a direction. What do you have to do? You have to figure out a point and a direction. Okay. Um, and then you're all set. Then you just kind of plug it into the formula. So here we need a point. We need a direction. Right? Just like in, in, in kind of high school math with the lines, you need a point and you need the slope. Right? Same exact idea. Okay? If you had a point and a slope in high school math, you had a line. Now, if you have a point and a direction, you have a line, okay? All right, so point, doesn't matter which one, right? Uh, one comma three comma minus one. That'll work perfectly fine, okay? Um, direction, well, we need a vector that points, um, if you put its tail at one, three minus one, it moves along the line, okay? So um, an easy one is, well, if I just, let me just draw a picture here, one, three uh, minus one. Uh, four two seven. Does this is not an accurate picture, of course. Um, I can just take that vector, right? Because the line looks something like this. Okay. So I just take four two seven, uh, or or let me say it like this: the vector that goes from the first point one three minus one to the vector four two seven, or to the point four two seven. Okay. So that's going to be four minus one. So going to be three comma two minus three minus one comma. 7 minus minus 1, so 8. All right, and that's it. Now we've got, we've got our line. So r of t is equal to, um, and again, this is my vector description, so I'm always going to put a little arrow on top. Uh, 1, 3 minus 1 plus t times 3 minus 1, 8. All right. Ah, I, I suddenly realized why I was putting the t on the other side, because um, traditionally, we, we put the T there. Okay, uh, and traditionally, we put the T there because we're thinking of uh, scalar multiplication of a scalar with a vector. And so we, we generally like to put that in front of the vector. Okay. Okay. Um, that looks a little weird. That's a minus one right there. All right. Um, and in terms of my parametric equations, X of T is equal to 1 plus 3T y of t is equal to 3 minus t, and z of t is equal to minus 1 uh, plus 8t. Okay, so those are my two kind of descriptions of the same line. All right. Okay, of course, if we had used a different point, uh, if we had used 4, 2, 7, and used a different direction, maybe the opposite direction, or maybe uh, the direction that's twice the length, we would write, we would end up with a slightly different description of the same line. All right. 
Okay. Um, I guess um, if you want to be really, really um, anal about it, we should always write down as, um, also what range of t. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have written the equal to. What range of t um, is legal? And of course, t goes from minus infinity to infinity. All right. So um, as t is negative, as t goes to minus infinity, we're describing points to the left in this picture. As t goes to infinity, we're describing points far and further and further away to the right. Okay. Let me just put that in parentheses. <laughs> okay. Um, if you need to describe, uh, by the way, uh, I, sh I should say something here. Um, notice that if we do um, a description of a line in this, using this procedure that I just did, notice that when t equals zero, what point am I getting? Um, in either way, right? For the r of, let me do it, I'll write down both. r of zero is gonna be equal to t is zero there, so that term is zeroed out, one, three, minus one. Okay, and that just happens to be our starting point. Okay, and but the interesting thing is t is one, we have r of one, is equal to, um, when t is one there, we're gonna get three plus one, which is four, and then minus one plus three, which is two, and then eight plus minus uh, one, which is seven. And of course, that's our second point, okay? So um, if we were interested, for example, in just a line segment from one, three, minus one, to two, four, uh, uh, four two, seven, then we could say that, um, uh, that line segment is described by the same equation, or same two equations if you want to talk about them both at once. But in that situation, um, we only care about t between zero and one. All right. So let me actually write this down. Line segment from, or let me not write from. Yeah, let's yeah from uh, minus one three minus one to four two seven is um, same R of T minus one plus T three minus one eight. Uh, but now we're only interested in T between zero and one. All right. And this is very useful for us. We're frequently going to be interested in only part of um, a line or part of a curve. And so we always want to be aware of which T's um, we actually are interested in for whatever particular problem we're uh, working. Okay. Um, by the way, I guess I said um, I don't really like this uh, vector description of a line because it feels unnatural. It is unnatural. Um, but it does have some advantages, and we'll see it um, next week when we talk about uh, vector-valued functions which is actually, which this is an example of. And basically the idea is that um, in the past, right, we you worked with uh, functions and their uh, derivatives. And the derivative of a function is a function, right? So if you work with this, um, this idea of a line described as a vector, then its derivative, which we'll talk about next week, is also described as a vector. Right? So everything is kind of, in a way, consistent. However, if you use the point of view, the parametric point of view, right, you're describing um, a line using three equations. But when you take the derivative, the proper way is to think of the derivative as a vector. Right? So things are a little kind of weird um, in that way. Uh, it's still the proper way to think of it, but uh, I think maybe people like to use this vector-valued function stuff because maybe it eases them into the multivariable calculus a little easier. Okay. In any case, um, let's see. So uh, in the homework, you'll see all sorts of uh, problems about um, these kinds of parametric equations or the, this kind of vector equation or parametric equation of a line. For example, maybe there'll be a problem um, is uh, two, four, seven on, on this line, right? On this line that we just wrote down. Um, ah, right there. Right, is two, four, seven on this line. How would you figure it out? Well, um, that would be an algebra problem, right? 
Um, in other words, is there a T? Can I find a T? So that when I plug that T into this slot right there, I get two comma four comma seven. Okay. Or um, if you use the parametric situation, uh, same idea. Can I find a T so that when I plug that T into here, the same T, of course, for all three um, equations, um, do I get two, four, and seven for the X, Y, and Z uh, values? All right. So uh, one thing you you can see here is that generally, um, if I just pick a random point out of nowhere, right, the answer is going to be no, because um, finding that t, right, would be a situation we talked about in the last lecture where you're finding uh, where you're solving three equations but only one unknown, right? So generally, there's no solutions. All right. So that means that in a way, lines are in quotes, kind of small compared to R3, right? If you randomly pick out a point um, off the top of your head, it's probably not gonna lie on that line. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna say uh, solve. Um, two comma seven, uh, sorry, two comma four comma seven equals one, three minus one plus t, 3 minus 1, 8, uh, for t, solve for t, and uh, let me do this. Solve for t, and uh, I'm not going to do it, uh, just probably no solutions. Right? And of course, if there's no solutions, it means it's not on the line. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So let's uh, let's uh, let's move on. Oh, actually, um, I want to say a couple things. If you are reading the book, or if you are looking at the book, I guess I haven't said at this point yet. Um, our book is actually pretty decent um, in terms of uh, as calculus books go. Uh, generally, I think calculus books are absolutely terrible, um, but our book is actually pretty decent. Um, so if you are reading it, uh, it does things. Uh, it does a lot of things in very careful detail. Um, when we get to derivatives, for example, it'll talk about limits and continuity, which we're going to skip because um, I don't know. Maybe for for uh, lower division calculus three class, it's not something that we absolutely need to spend time on, uh, especially in a summer class where um, the pace is so fast. If we can save some time, it's, it's nice to do it. Okay, um, so if you are reading the book, uh, you'll see that the book describes, um, has, a, has a tiny mini section in this, uh, in this section about distance from a point to a line. So this is in the book. Um, I'm skipping it completely. Um, it's kind of interesting, right? The book comes up with a formula for figuring out that, you know, if I give you a line and I give you a point that's not on that line, how far are they from each other? Um, but I'm going to skip it uh, because this is something that we can do in the future using um, when we talk about optimization um, and in particular Lagrange multipliers. So why spend time coming up with... Uh, um, ad hoc formula for this when there's a general principle which can do this for us uh, for many different situations, all right? The, the secret um, hint, how does this relate to optimization? Well, the secret is that if you have a line and you have a point that's, that's not on the line, um, the distance from the point to the line is going to be what you get when you drop this perpendicular, all right? How do you get that? Well, distance, um, uh, the distance from the point to the line is determined by um, well, this point, if you don't know anything, right, um, the distance could be, you know, you could just compare this point with every other point on the line. Compare it with every other point on the line and see which one is the closest, right? And in terms of the picture, you can see it should be the one that's perpendicular, like that, right? In any case, the one that's closest means the one that has smallest distance, which means we're finding the minimum of the distance function, which means we're minimizing something, and that's optimization, 
All right, so we'll cover this in the optimization section uh, of our class. And even if we don't, you'll, um, uh, the way we teach it, right? Uh, once, you, once you understand it, you can figure this out yourself. All right, um, let's see. Ah, uh, another thing you might see in the homework, um, just very, this, this is a couple of miscellaneous things, um, is what happens if I ask you uh, where do the line, uh, and I'm just gonna make up two, two random lines, R1 of T equals two, three, four, plus um, T times one, or let's make it a two, I guess, four minus one, and R2 of t equals one zero zero plus uh, t times one four five. Where do these intersect? All right. Um, I think there might be a homework problem, uh, online homework problem on this. Uh, but again, it's just an algebra problem, right? Uh, where do the lines intersect? Well, lines intersect. Uh, what is the point of intersection? Uh, the whole meaning of the point of intersection is that it's a point that lives on line number one, and the point also lives on line number two, right? So you need to find um, uh, a point that lives on both lines, right? So you take this equation here, take this equation here, you figure out if it's, you know, if there is a line that lives on both, um, that's that where, where you can find t's that satisfy both, uh, uh, both, equa both uh, sets of uh, equations. All right. Now it doesn't have to be the same t for both of these, um, because for example, um, if I describe R, uh, the line R one like this, right? If even if there is an intersection, the t might be um, if my initial vector is like this, my t looks like it'll be four, right? Whereas if I describe the second line using this point, and the vector I used was this one to describe the line, then my t would actually looks like it would be minus one. Right? So it could be different t's um, used to describe the same line. All right? So you have to work it out um, how to determine whether you have one point on the same line. So I'll let you guys think about that a little bit. Okay. Um, so that's it for lines, at least for now. Again, we'll be using, um, we'll be talking about lines quite a bit in the future. Uh, let's now talk about planes. So we're talking about planes in space, of course. Because if we're talking about um, R2, or the plane, there's only one plane, so nothing really interesting. So what's a plane in space? A plane is um, exactly what, what you would imagine a plane is, uh, like a piece of paper, right, that extends infinitely. Okay, so normally we would draw a representation like this, right? Um, and let me emphasize that this is in space by drawing the axes. Okay, um, so we want to uh, work with planes, um, this geometric object. Uh, how do we express it in terms of a formula or an equation or something like that, all right? So the idea here is that we can describe a plane in space, again, very similar to lines. We can de describe a plane in space by um, two bits of information. So the first bit of information is a point on the plane. Okay. The second bit of information, now very different from the situation of lines, is I'm not going to use the direction uh, or, let's say, uh, a vector that's on the plane, because there's too many vectors on the plane, right? This guy's on the plane, this guy's on the plane, like that, right? So what I'm going to use is I'm going to use the normal vector. Let me do it in a different color. Normal vector. The, the a vector here, the vector here, that's perpendicular to my plane. All right? So this guy here is my normal vector, or a normal vector. And normally we use the notation n. Uh, it's a vector, right? It's a directional object. Um, so uh, n with a, with arrow on top. Okay. So uh, I guess I should give a name to the point as well, right? So let's call it um, x naught, y naught, z naught. All right. So first of all. Um, if I give you a point in space, and I give you a normal vector, and I say the plane that I'm thinking about is the one that you know is perpendicular to that normal vector, then that determines completely which plane I'm talking about. 
all right? So just like a line, right? A point and the direction of the line completely determines which plane, which line I'm talking about. These two bits of information completely determine the plane, okay? Um, if I only give you the point, right, and no direction, there's gonna be many planes that pass through the same point, all right? If I only give you a normal direction, there's gonna be many planes um, that have that normal direction, um, to have that uh, uh, normal direction, right? So uh, it's not enough. So you actually need both uh, both bits of information, okay? All right, let's get an equation for this. Um, let me do it like this. So, yeah, I guess I guess I could do it in this picture up here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a, another point on the plane, all right? Uh, let's say right there. And I'm going to call this X, Y, Z. Okay? And let's figure out what property that X, Y, Z has to satisfy being that it's on the plane. All right? Okay. Um, well, let's think about um, this vector right there. Uh, let me use blue this vector right there that goes from my uh, my base point or the point that we know is on the plane to the point x, y, z, all right? Notice that this vector has to be perpendicular to the normal vector, right? Because both points live on the plane, okay? Um, in fact, this is generally true. If I pick any two point on this plane and I draw a vector between them, then it's gonna be perpendicular to this red vector, okay? All right, any vector that lies that, you know, if you draw it, um, it's head and tail. If it's head and tail are on the plane, then it's gonna be perpendicular to the red vector. And that's the important point, right? So the blue vector is perpendicular to the red vector. Okay, um, let, me, um, let me write down uh, coordinates for the red vector, for the normal vector. So let's say the normal vector is uh, ABC. All right, um, again, we have a point on a plane, x0, y0, z0. We have a second point on the plane, x, y, z. Now, let me write down the blue vector. The blue vector is um, x minus x0, comma, y minus y0, comma, z minus z0, okay? So just, you know, the head minus the tail. All right, and what did I just say? Uh, well, this blue vector is perpendicular to red vector. So this is perpendicular to ABC. Okay. So if you are on this plane, then you have to be, then then uh, when I create this vector on the left, it has to be perpendicular to ABC, right? And notice that um, kind of the other way is also true. If I take a point that's not on the plane, right? Let's say up here, and I, I uh, draw the same vector, it's not for sure not going to be perpendicular to the normal vector, okay? So to be perpendicular for this uh, guy on this left-hand side, to be perpendicular to ABC means that X comma Y comma Z lies on my plane, all right? All right, so that's the first important um, realization. The second one is that uh, we know what it means for two vectors to be parallel, right? Two vectors are parallel, means that um, their dot products is zero, okay? So that's our here's our first kind of major application. So this means that x minus x is zero, y minus y naught, z minus z naught, dot abc is equal to zero, okay? And now I'm just gonna calculate the dot product. So this tells me a times x minus x naught plus b times y minus y naught plus c times z minus z naught equals zero. All right, that, I guess there's nothing we can do about running out of space there. Uh, equals zero, okay. And what is this? This is my equation of the plane, All right? This equation describes my plane. It describes my plane because if x comma y comma z is, is on the plane, then this equation is satisfied. 
if x, y, z is not on my plane, then when I plug it into this equation, it's not going to be satisfied. The left-hand side is not going to be equal to zero. All right? So this describes my plane. Um, notice that uh, for planes in space, for a plane in R3, you can describe it with just one equation. And remember, um, for lines in the plane, you could describe it with just one equation. And that's because, in general, if you have um, uh, whatever dimension you're in, let's say uh, you're in R3 in space, if, you, if I give you one equation, right, then that's going to describe a two-dimensional object, like a plane. All right. Um, if I give you one equation in R2, that's going to describe, so this is a two-dimensional object. Uh, one equation in R2 is going to describe a one-dimensional object. Okay. So in general, if you have one equation in R anything, Rn, that's going to describe an n minus one-dimensional object. All right. So every time you add an equation, in fact, um, generically, what happens is you lose a dimension in your object. Okay, so if I wrote down two equations and I said, what are in R3? If I wrote down two equations in R3 and I said, um, what is the, uh, uh, what are the set of points that satisfy both equations? That's generally going to be a one-dimensional object. Okay. In general, of course, all of this is in general. There's obvious. There's definitely. Um, exceptions. Okay. Oh, by the way, um, having said that, I might as well um, kind of finish off that thought. That means that actually, uh, we describe lines in a particular way, right, using um, the vector equation, or using the param uh, um, parametric equations. Uh, that might lead you to think about a, a different description of a, of a line, right? We can describe a line in R3 by using two equations. Right? Two equations like this, right? something equals zero, for example, and another thing equals zero, can describe a one-dimensional object. And so that means that two equations can describe a line. Right? Um, that's also used as well. Uh, we'll use it in the future uh, when we talk about optimization. Uh, but for now, the parametric equation is good enough for us. OK. Um, Let's see. Uh, so in general, um, if I have an equation that looks like something like um, ax plus by plus cz equals a number, d, then this is a plane. Uh, sorry. That's a plane, right? Um, in fact, you can easily read off the information. Um, the normal vector is a, b, c, right? And if you want to point on the plane, uh, no problem. You just uh, solve this equation. And there's an infinite number of solutions, so it's super easy, right? So for example, um, let's say c were not 0. Then I could just use x equals 0, y equals 0, and z, and z equals d over c, OK? So um, you can always kind of recover the two necessary bits of information uh, from an equation uh, that looks like this. OK? All right. Um, why do we care about planes? Why are we going to care about planes uh, in the future? Uh, we care because, remember, in one variable calculus, right? here's a function, f of x, something that was really, really important in one variable calculus was understanding the tangent line. Right, um, the tangent line, for example, uh, one major application in one variable calculus was uh, the tangent line was used to do linear approximation, and that allowed us to estimate values of f of x using only information about let's call this x zero, about f of x zero, and about f prime at x zero. Right, if I have these two numbers right there, then I can guess or I can make an estimate for f of, let's say, that point, right? My estimate is going to be that one, right? Whereas the actual value, of course, is right there, 
right? But of course, if we're if we're um, working with points close to our base point x zero, then our estimate is often going to be relatively accurate. Okay, um, so this was the basis for, or you could think of this as the basis for um, Taylor series. In uh, probably you did it in second semester or second quarter calculus. That this is the basis for Taylor series, right? We're approximating f using a line. In Taylor series, you're approximating using a parabola, using a, a cubic, using a degree four, using infinite, in a way, infinite um, uh, degree polynomial. Okay. All right. Anyway, um, so. The, the tangent line in a uh, two variable or in a one variable setting is uh, very important, right? So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing um, in a couple weeks, we're going to be doing two variable calculus or multivariable calculus. And what's going to happen is um, our domain. So in one variable calculus, our domain is down here, just the X, um, uh, the line, right? And our range we draw as the vertical. Uh, in the future, we're going to be talking about f of x, y. Our domain is going to be the plane down here. And our uh, range is going to be represented by the z. And our, the graph of our functions, um, analogous to this curvy little graph here, is going to be something looks like this. Right? So for example, um, here's my input. And up there is my output. Same idea. Well. Um, instead of tangent line, you can even see it from this picture, we're going to have the concept of a tangent plane. All right, And the tangent plane is going to have the same importance that the tangent line had in uh, one variable calculus. So you definitely want to be um, or get as comfortable as possible working with planes. OK. Um, so that's kind of a, a preview of maybe stuff we'll talk about two weeks, uh, roughly two weeks from now. <laughs> All right, so if you look at the homework, um, there's a bunch of homeworks where, uh, homework problem, the online homework, there's a bunch of problems where they want you to find the equation of a plane uh, given various bits of information, right? Uh, here's one, here's a nice one. Uh, let's say, wh uh, what is the equation of the plane that passes through Uh, let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, right? Um, 2 is not enough, right? 2 points is not enough because um, 2 points determines a line, and there's many planes through the same line, right? So I need one more, uh, 1, 2, uh, minus 1, right? Uh, 3 points determine a plane. Okay, so if I give you 3 points, there's actually only one plane that passes through those 3 points. So the picture would be something like, something like this. All right, so maybe this this guy is that one, this guy is that one, this guy is that one. All right, so what is the plane that passes through um, uh, these three points? Um, that's a tip. This is a, like a typical uh, homework problem, and again, uh, just like with lines, whenever you're asked to find the equation of a line, you need a point and you need a, uh, the direction of the line. Right? If you need to find the equation of a plane, you need a point and you need the normal direction. So immediately. Uh, you're all set with the point, right? Any one of the three. So um, let's just use one comma two comma three, right? Okay. What about the um, what about a normal direction? How do we do that? Um, we're not given anything obvious, right? But um, here's where um, we have to think a little bit, and where we get to use uh, the stuff from the previous section. Uh, if we think about this vector right there. Right, which we can easily write down. It's uh, let's see, zero comma zero comma uh, minus four. Right, just subtracting the coordinates of this point minus the coordinates of that point. So this this uh, uh, vector is easy to find. Let's find this vector there, right, which is also super easy to find. Right, it's actually going to be three comma uh, three comma seven. Right, um, we need the normal. Right, so we need something that's perpendicular to both these guys. What gives? How do we find a vector that's perpendicular to two other vectors? Cross product. Right. So what I can do is I can just take the cross product. Um, 
let me actually, I guess I should just actually write these down. So this is going to be 0, comma, 0, comma, uh, minus 4. And this other one was 3, comma, 3, comma, 7, right? So the normal is just going to be, or one normal is, um, is 0, comma, 0, comma, minus 4. Cross product, 3, comma, 3, comma, 7. Okay. All right, and you just calculate that, and you've got the normal. Um, uh, it's going to point in uh, using the right-hand rule. Um, I'm doing 0, 0, 4, minus 4 first. So uh, the right-hand rule tells me, in terms of the picture, the normal is going to point in this direction. Okay. All right, and, that, and using these two bits of information, I can get uh, the equation of my plane just using um, uh, the formula above. All right. Okay, uh, by the way, notice that, of course, um, there's many different normals we could use, right? Um, if I had even just chosen 337 cross 0, 0, minus 4 instead, I would get a different normal. I would get the normal that points downwards, right? If I had chosen um, 0, 0, 4 and this vector instead, right, then I would get a different normal. Um, but ultimately, it doesn't matter. As long as I have a normal, I'm going to get an equation um, all the way up here. Where is it? I'm going to get an equation for my plane. And ultimately, if you um, put the equation into this form, uh, let's use red. If you put the equation into this form over here, it's going to be um, the two, the two, your two equations are going to be exactly the same. All right. Just like if you put two lines into, uh, uh, if you, even if you use uh, two different points and um, uh, to describe a line in, in uh, high school math, in line in the plane, uh, you're going to end up with the same equation if you kind of put it into y equals mx plus b, right? So the same idea here. Okay, so um, so there's you'll probably find a few tricky problems in the in the homework where you know, they don't exactly give you the information that you directly need, but you have to, th so you have to think a little bit to see, you know, how you can get a point, how you can get a normal direction. Okay. And as usual, um, if you, if you can't figure it out, you got questions, uh, that's what the Zoom meetings on um, Thursdays are for. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, let me say a couple. Uh, so the rest of this um, lecture is just going to be a bunch of miscellaneous uh, miscellaneous things. The core of the topic we've already covered, how to get the equation of a line, how to get the equation of a plane. All right. OK. Um, how do you tell if a plane or two planes are parallel? That's a that's a fun question. Right. Um, are when uh, how to tell, let me actually just write what I, what I literally said. How to tell if two planes are parallel. All right? How do you tell? Well, um, just think about the picture, right? Two planes, they're parallel, right? In other words, they don't touch. Um, if I draw them like this, you can see, well, the normal of this one is going to be maybe something like this. The normal of the second one, maybe something like this, right? Their normals are parallel, right? So pretty simple. Normals are parallel, right? And if their normals aren't parallel, then the two planes cannot be parallel because that would mean that um, you, have, you have this skewed normal. So maybe let's say another plane like this, whose normal is in this direction, right? Then eventually it's going to intersect um, the plane as I extend as I extend this plane out. Okay, so there's a lot of fun little problems that um, that you might see uh, like this on the homework. Okay, uh, what about this? How to tell if two planes? This is more interesting or uh, maybe more complicated. Are perpendicular. Right? So the picture would be something like this.
right? How do I, uh, let me extend this one down also. How do I tell if I have this picture, All right? Well, uh, again, just think about the normals. Um, the normal for this plane, maybe something like this, right? The normal for that plane, something like this, right? And you can see that they have to be perpendicular to each other, okay? So let me, let, me, uh, let me draw them together like this, just to visualize it. All right? Okay, so everything you need to know about um, planes, uh, you can get from the, the two bits of information, from the normal, from a point on the plane. Okay. Um, What about this? Uh, I have a plane, 3x plus 4y plus 5z equals 10. I have a line, um, r of t. Again, I'm, I'm trying to use the vector notation uh, as much as possible just because we'll be uh, doing something very similar next week. Um, let's say 3 plus, oh, sorry, comma, uh, minus 1 comma 2 plus t times 1 0 minus 1 right so I have a plane and a line uh, where do they intersect All right so um, this is a, a nice problem uh, I've got a plane I've got an equ equation of a plane I've got the equation of a line how do I figure out where they intersect, if, if they intersect, of course, right? Um, so it's something uh, for you to think about, but essentially um, you want, um, of course, a point. So again, what does it mean for things to intersect, right? It means that, so let me draw a picture. So if I have a, a, a line and a plane intersecting, that point is the intersection. What's the most important feature of this point? It's that this point lies on this line, right? This point also lies on a plane. So what you're looking for is a single point that lies both on this plane and it lies on this line. Okay? All right, I'll let you think about it from here. Again, if you have trouble, Thursday, uh, Zoom meeting. Okay. Um, Intersection of two planes. So this is a, a very standard um, homework problem you might see. I think I assigned one like similar to this on the, uh, on the, on the online homework. Uh, if I have two planes, they typically intersect in a line. All right, so let's say here's two planes. Typically they intersect in a line. Let me uh, color that line red. What's the equation of that line, right? If I know the equation of the plane. So let's say uh, the first, uh, first plane um, has normal vector n1, right? Let's say the second plane has normal vector n2, right? Um, how do I figure out the equation uh, of this red line, right? So again, to get the equation of a line, I need a point in a direction. So um, typically in these kinds of problems, you'll have an equation for the plane, for both plane number one, and plane number two. So that means you can find, um, so this line, so again, same idea as the previous uh, problem. The idea is that this uh, red uh, dotted line, or this red line here, lives on both planes, right? So um, every point on this line lives on plane number one, and it lives on plane number two. So it satisfies the equation for plane number one, and it satisfies the equation for plane number two, right? So you need to solve for a point um, that lives on both planes, right? Um, so you need to solve the two equations of the plane simultaneously, right? Um, eh, maybe I should, I should actually write down a numerical example. So let's say the first uh, plane is 2x plus 4y plus 5z equals 1. Second plane is uh, x minus y minus z equals 2, right? So to find a point on the line, one thing you can do is... Um, solve system of equations, 2x plus 4y plus 5z equals 1, x minus y minus z equals 2, right? There's going to be an infinite number of solutions, 
But if you if you solve for one of those solutions, you'll get one point. Okay, and pretty clear. Uh, another way to you can also solve for a second point, and then you can subtract them to get the direction. Okay, but um, an alternative point of view is that I can actually take n1 cross n2, right? That's going to be perpendicular to both n1 and n2, right? Uh, just by definition of the cross product, right? So this is another mini example or mini um, application of the cross product. So this guy's going to be perpendicular to both n1 and n2. And if you think about that, right, what's a vector that's perpendicular to both n1 and n2? It's going to be a vector that's in the direction of the line. Okay. So um, you can use both points of views. All right. Okay. Um, Let's see. Ah, okay. So one more small point, and we're we're pretty much. Uh, I think we're done. So the last point is, if you do, if you are reading the book, uh, you'll see that the book has a mini subsection on distance from a point to a plane. Um, so again, I have a point. I have a plane. How far is this point to the plane? Well, um, the book goes through a formula uh, or goes through um, uh, a derivation for a formula for this distance. Uh, of course, you're given the, you know, the point and you're given the equation of the plane. Um, but again, I'm going to skip it because it's foolish. I find it kind of foolish to find this uh, formula when we're going to be able to do it using optimization in the future. And again, why optimization? Same exact reason for distance from a point to a line. Because uh, what you're actually trying to figure out is comparing this point to every point on the plane. How far is this? How far is this? How far is this? How far is this? The distance is the one that's as close as possible. So it's going to be this point right there. OK? It'll turn out to be that. And so it'll be um, the minimum. Uh, among all points on the plane of the distance from that point to the plane. So it's going to be an optimization problem, finding the minimum of the distance function. All right. So we're just going to completely, uh, completely skip that. Okay. Um, oh, uh, I guess let me just say one more thing, just uh, a fun thing. Um, that's just kind of interesting. You don't necessarily need it for this class. Uh, the intersection of two planes. Why is that a line? Um, well, it's pretty obvious it's a line just in terms of the pictures, right? But uh, one way you can kind of understand intersection of uh, geometrical objects, this guy here is two-dimensional, right? It's a plane. Um, the second plane is two-dimensional, all right? So there's a general principle here that um, if you intersect two two-dimensional things, what do you get? Well, two, two-dimensional, two-dimensional, you add the two, so you get two plus two. And then, uh, well, that gives you four. What's the dimension of the entire uh, world that you're in? We're in uh, R3, we're in space. So the dimension of the entire world is three. So the dimension of the uh, intersection of two two-dimensional objects in R3 is going to be 2 plus 2, which is 4, minus 3. So 4 minus 3 is 1. And so the intersection of these two two-dimensional objects is one-dimensional. Okay. And so that's that makes sense in terms of this uh, picture. But um, obviously, we'll be looking at more complicated things, uh, surfaces in the future. So we might be thinking about what is the intersection of this sphere, um, with uh, with a plane, with this plane right there, right? So immediately you know the sphere. Uh, when I say sphere, I mean the surface of a sphere, okay? Um, so the surface of a sphere, a, a sphere intersected with a plane, a sphere is two-dimensional. Di two 
a plane is two-dimensional. And so its intersection, you expect to be one-dimensional in general. And in fact, um, it's going to be because it's, it's going to be a circle. OK. All right. Um, again, uh, I'm very careful always to say in general, because this is not always true. Uh, for example, even in this sphere example, right? If I take this sphere right here, and I take the plane that just touches the North Pole, then the intersection is actually just one dimensional instead of two, uh, instead of, um, sorry, the intersection is zero dimensional. It's just a point instead of um, uh, one dimensional, the circle, okay? All right, so that'll come into some use in the future for us because we will be talking about intersection of uh, surfaces. Um, one example will be when we talk about um, optimization. All right, uh, that's pretty much it for this section. Uh, again, this whole week is set up for the rest of the class. We'll be using a lot of the stuff um, from, from this week over and over and over again. Uh, the, the one minor exception is cross products we're not gonna use as, uh, as much um, until towards the very, very end of the class. All right. Okay, um, I'm going to end here.